Welcome to War Room, the official podcast of the U.S. Army War College Online Journal, graciously supported by the Army War College Foundation. Please join the conversation at warroom.armywarcollege.edu. We hope you enjoy the program. The views expressed in this presentation are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect those of the U.S. Army War College, U.S. Army, or Department of Defense. Hello, and welcome to A Better Peace, the War Room Podcast. I'm Ron Granary, Professor of History in the Department of National Security and Strategy at the U.S. Army War College and Podcast Editor of The War Room. It's a pleasure to have you join us. Leadership brings many perks, but it also places special burdens on the leader. This becomes especially clear when a unit faces an unexpected trauma. Whether in the battle space or in the rear, as the result of hostile action or health emergency or accident, traumatic loss sends shockwaves through any unit, leaving scars both visible and invisible. An effective leader realizes this and takes up the challenge of rebuilding the unit and moving it forward. But knowing how to do that is far from automatic and requires a degree of empathy that traditional military training often overlooks. Determining how to prepare leaders for managing trauma remains a crucial missing element in leader preparation. Our guest today, Colonel Andrew Deaton, has wrestled with these leadership problems in his professional work with the military police and has reflected upon them in a recent article, Turning Tragedy into Triumph, Leading Your Organization to Excel Following Trauma, in the January 2020 issue of Police Chief Magazine. Colonel Deaton is a 23-year Army professional and current resident student at the Army War College. His extensive military experience includes building teams across organizations involving five military branches, civilian federal organizations, and other non-governmental entities. We are delighted to have him with us today for this conversation. Welcome, Colonel Deaton. Thank you, Ron. I appreciate the opportunity. It's great to be here. So should I ask you how your year at the Army War College is going so far? I've actually really enjoyed it. Uh, definitely privileged to be here. Just the opportunities to be exposed to some strategic leaders and the level of learning and education here is phenomenal. Right. Well, we're, we're lucky to have you. Where was your last duty assignment? I was the chief of staff for the U.S. Army Military Police School at Fort Leonard Wood. Fort Leonard Wood in Missouri. In Missouri. So um, in your article... Uh, in Police Chief Magazine, you you coin a phrase and use it a lot. You talk about leading beyond the ordinary. And so I want to start right there. What do you think it means to say that leaders should seek to lead beyond the ordinary? Ron, I think that goes to what you've alluded to with sometimes professional education may not touch on everything a leader needs to do, nor can it, because it's so vast. But particularly when you get into a, an area of trauma by the, when the trauma hits, that's not the time to figure out how to respond to it. That's not the time. It's too late to build the organization to be resilient in those circumstances at that point. Leaders have a lot of things, of course, they learn through professional education, how to run organizations, you know, assess their higher headquarters intent, resource, things of that nature. That goes toward the management side, the leadership side of training, educating, preparing their there, whether it be soldiers, sailors, airmen, marine, coast guardsmen, and then you know with the new space force, but you have to start with what some people, particularly in the early days of my career, may have considered the touchy feely side mm-hmm. of leadership. Which it's really not. Today, you see a lot more about emotional intelligence, empathy, uh, understanding. Whereas you can't just look at you know, the soldiers or whomever, the service members may be uh, titled there. What I like to tell people is don't just know the soldier in the uniform, know the man or the woman behind the uniform, Mm -hmm. whether that be civilian law enforcement, military police, any other branch of the service, because particularly as a first line leader, they need to know something about them, about their families, what drives them, what makes them tick. That's going to help them understand how to develop them. So along those lines, so you uh, would would it be fair to say, as you mentioned, the, the problem with the, the touchy-feely or not touchy-feely element of leadership, that uh, the cultivation of empathy is not a, uh, a formal part of your training as a leader in the United States Army? Is it, fa- would it, is it fair to say that? In general, it is not talked about as much. We have made strides in the last few years of realizing, hey, this is important. 
this is not just some something up in the uh, ether mm-hmm. that psychologists talk about or psychiatrists talk about. This is a basic component of truly effective leadership mm-hmm. because you could have a a leader who is very technically and tactically proficient and you elevate that all the way up to the strategic level. Mm-hmm. How did you uh, how did you come by? Uh, the insights that you have as a leader? Do you credit uh, leaders that you've observed or worked under up to now that have helped you to get a sense of what makes a good leader? Absolutely. Uh, I've been fortunate enough to have some very uh, good leaders that I've been able to look at some of the effective things they've done. Uh, just like many service members have also had some leaders that fall on the not so much side. Sometimes they can be as educational as the good ones. Right? They can be very good. I've run across uh, both toxic leaders and phenomenal leaders. And looking at the ones who did things that took organizations through extremely difficult times, that you could tell how much they were respected because not when they were around, but when they were not around, Hmm. how soldiers would talk about them, how they would understand their intent, how they would understand, hey, the so what factor about why are we doing this? Why is this leader asking me to put my life on the line and why do I think it's a good thing to do it? Mm -hmm. That shows that leader truly understands and can relate to empathize with his, his or her subordinates. Uh, In your article, you talk about specific crises in your own experience that helped you think about what trauma meant in a unit. Would you, uh, would you be willing to sketch out one of those examples here for our audience today? One of my first was I was a young captain. I was a company commander at Fort Hood, Texas, and we had a staff sergeant who was my operations sergeant. We'll call him Staff Sergeant G. And we did physical fitness in the morning. We went on a company run. And afterwards, several of us saw him sitting there at a picnic table, uh, talked to him. He responded absolutely normal. And then not terribly long later, my first sergeant and I were sitting in my office. Somebody just starts pounding on the door hey, we're busy, come back later. No, we need you right now. Sergeant G is down the hall and he's not responding. We're racing down the hallway. We uh, yell out for medics that were, battalion medics were in the area in their office nearby. And we went into the room and Sergeant G was slumped over. It was already uh, cyanotic turning blue on the lips. And the two medics that were there started taking care of him until, of course, EMS arrived, the ambulance crew took over and rushed him to the ER, and unfortunately, he did uh, pass away. The two medics in particular thought they had messed up. Mm -hmm. They even made comments to the effect of, we screwed up, we let Sergeant G die. Mm -hmm. And that's where the leadership came in, you know, from the squad leader level all the way on up through the battalion commander and others. It's like, no, you did everything right. The ambulance crew even said, hey, you did everything right. It was, he was probably gone before we ever found him. Mm -hmm. Uh, Unfortunately, it was a massive unexpected heart attack. That in itself was traumatic enough. Mm -hmm. Uh, Then we also found out later with his uh, family, she was pregnant with their first child, and they've been trying for um, quite some time, a number of years, to have a child. So that hit the family and the unit family even harder. Mm -hmm. And I guess then as the commander, uh, your job was not just to deal with the immediate practical uh, effects, but also to think about how you uh, how you pull the unit back together um, and how you get them to confront uh, to confront the elements of the trauma that are not as easy to see. You mentioned the, the idea that EMTs can feel a sense of guilt or responsibility. Uh, to be able to address that with them uh, is part of leadership. Did you, I, I'm curious, when you, when you dealt with that, did you consult with anybody above you to figure out how to deal with this? Or was this something that you, uh, in consultation with your immediate subordinates, figured out how to, how to pull the unit back together? The initial response, of course, was you know, responding to the emergency room, the family, particularly when the doctor had to tell uh, Sergeant G's wife that he had passed away and the obvious impact. Um, until her family could get there to be with her, uh, particularly since she was expecting a child, and we needed to look at her medical state to make sure with that additional stress, that trauma and the shock, that it didn't transfer over uh, and cause additional harm to the unborn child. 
So coordinating properly with the medical, uh, bringing in the chaplain, um, counselors, coordinating with the battalion chain of command to get that immediate assistance. Uh, Division of labor was also critical because nobody in that period in a trauma like that can do it all themselves. And particularly the more senior of an organization you get, the commander or the the first sergeant or the command sergeant major, whomever it may be, shouldn't try to do it all themselves mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. they can very quickly become overwhelmed. As I talk about in the article, a critical thing for a senior leader, especially the senior leader in a given organization, not so much being a doer, but use your rank and your position to open doors to empower and enable key subordinates that know the intent because you've built that uh, family environment in a unit, meaning that, hey, we're going to pull together. We're always going to support one another. We're going to be there for each other. And people will know if you truly mean that or not. It's mm-hmm. easy to say it, but until they see you sharing the hardship with them, using your position to benefit their ability to be successful, making those calls where perhaps you send them to school, understanding it'll impact the admission of the unit because they're gone Mm -hmm. but because you want to develop them as a leader taking Mm -hmm. your time to set aside that's going to build that foundation and that environment in a unit where when tragedy strikes they're like okay this is rough this is bad everybody's in shock but we know here's the foundation we rest on and it's again it's not just the one leader because if you are that leader beyond the ordinary you're not only doing that yourselves, you've inculcated that in your subordinate leaders who are doing it to, with their subordinate leaders all the way down to the most junior level. Mm-hmm. It, is, it is a paradox, right, that being in the army, being in the military more broadly, right, to a certain extent, right, you're always prepared for uh, the ultimate tragedy, right? The, the war, warfare requires being prepared for all kinds of terrible things to happen. Yes. And yet, uh, would you say that it is different uh, or harder or easier to deal with the kinds of tragedies like the one you described that happen on a day when everyone is safe and far away from anybody shooting at them? I don't know if I would say it was harder or easier in either mm-hmm. circumstance. Right. Because as you mentioned, being in the military, we are what I would say is academically prepared, mm-hmm. understanding that we're in a line of work where we have a, or excuse me, we are trained to engage in environments where there's people who may wish us harm. Yeah. And we knowingly do that. So we know that is a constant specter that could come up. Mm-hmm. Even in a combat zone, when it does happen, it's still going to be a shock to the unit. Mm-hmm. Now, in peacetime, it may be a more of a shock initially because you don't anticipate it as consciously because it's not quite as present. Mm-hmm. You get a little bit more comfortable. But the impact to the unit is going to be no less significant in either circumstance. It's going to it's going to hurt the unit, particularly when you built that family bond. Right. And you, of course, being in the military police, right, I think that uh, uh, in the civilian world, right, uh, police officers have to deal with levels of trauma, right, not only trauma that happens to their unit, but also they arrive in the midst of other people's traumas as well. And so for the military police, how did you work your way into a sense of understanding how to handle both the traumas within your unit when something happens to a member of your unit, but also how do you, how do you help the people whose trauma you are called to deal with? In all honesty, it starts with being able to help yourself first. Mm-hmm. And by that, I mean understanding and thinking through and reflecting on, okay, if something happens, how am I going to respond? You know, while I have the shock and the impact to my psyche, how am I going to maintain that solid foundation of leadership to set that example to say, hey, we're the rock in the storm, Mm -hmm. understanding this is the environment that we operate in, this is our responsibility, whether that be military police, civilian police, the DA, uh, Department of the Army, civilian police that we have on many of our camps, posts, and stations, as well as equivalents in other services, uh, EMTs, ambulance crews, fire, all the first responder uh, organizations face similar types of trauma because they go into that. Mm-hmm. And it also goes back to that emotional intelligence, not just to understand subordinates, but to be able to control your own. And that doesn't mean control yourself from getting angry. You know, 
not letting the trauma and the fear take over to where it makes them ineffective. Mm -hmm. So it starts individually. uh And then and only then, when you have that control over yourself, can you inculcate that in your subordinates. And I see this as a... uh an interesting challenge listening to you describe it, right? That on the one hand, as a leader uh, or as a policeman dealing with the trauma, you have to control your emotions, but, but you also, uh, you can't be complete. You can't control your emotions to the point that you're cut off to the existence of emotions. I guess you have to be aware that the people you're dealing with will be dealing with uh, uh, emotional responses. And you need to, when you talk about having emotional intelligence, right? That means you have to be willing, even though you're not going to, give way to fear. You're not going to give way to sadness. You have to be at least open enough to them. You can't simply be wooden in dealing with people who are, uh, who are experiencing these kinds of emotions. And that's, so it's not so much, it's not that you're turning your emotions off. When you talk about controlling them, that means you are managing them in a way that they're always present. Is that fair to say? Absolutely. Yeah. And this is where I talk about in the article, it's okay. And you should in the appropriate manner, let your subordinates know, hey, when things like this strike, you're affected too. Mm-hmm. Whether that be through, you know, in some cases, leaders absolutely should shed a tear. Not contrived by any means, but if it's genuine, it's okay. You don't have to hide that. Mm-hmm. It doesn't show you're weak as a leader. It shows you're a human, that that person matters to you, the organization matters to you. And that's going to show them that, hey, what they're feeling is normal. Mm-hmm. They're not weak. They've gone through tragedy, uh, having dealt with it uh, in other ways as well. We talk about preparing leaders on, in so many different ways. I mean, so much of officer training is all about preparing people to be leaders. Where do you think we should, we as a military, we as the army, uh, where do you think we should be uh, more consciously uh, inserting these discussions of emotional intelligence and empathy in our leadership training. There should certainly should be some discussion of it during professional military education. Mm-hmm. However, again, that goes back to the academic understanding. What's really going to make the difference is the application. And that doesn't mean, hey, I'm going to write this document. Hey, go read this. This makes you think that uh, a given leader cares. You know, have you gone out and gotten to know your subordinates? And particularly the more senior you get, you can't know every detail, nor should you try to get involved down in the, in the weeds, as we say, with every soldier. But whether it be through your chain of command, your immediate subordinates, you should know them as a first-line leader knows, like a squad leader knows his or her subordinates. Mm-hmm. So say as a brigade commander, battalion commander, do you know what drives and makes your subordinates tick as far as the battalion commander's command sergeants major, the company commanders, and down on the line, and they should do that at their level. Do you take the time to show up in their work area? Do you go talk to them while they're in what you would call their environment, their workspace? Or do you just do it in a big sterile environment, Mm -hmm. in a big room, in a conference room, in a group, where you can't really have those one-on-one conversations that convey, hey, you, not just as a soldier filling a uniform, But you as an individual matter, not because you're doing this function, but because you bring qualities to the organization that enhance everybody. Hmm. It's an interesting point, right? That, that obviously the reason why people wear uniforms, the reason why we, we, uh, we have ranks is so people can, can be to a degree interchangeable, but it's important to remember, uh, who is, who is in that position and you'll get the most out of somebody if you have a sense of, of who they are and what they bring. Yes, and understanding those personal aspects of someone, particularly beyond their military skill set, that keys them, hey, if this leader remembers that, hey, I enjoy woodworking, Mm -hmm. and they come and ask me to build a farewell gift that's customized to someone leaving, you know, obviously providing the appropriate support uh, so the burden doesn't fall on that subordinate, but they respect my capability, not because I'm ex-military specialty, but because they know this about me through the chain of command or directly, Mm -hmm. hey, they took the time. They took their time as a leader to understand me as a person, not just me as a soldier. Mm -hmm. And this will really help in times of trauma because a lot of people are very aware of immediate aftermath of a trauma. These are the steps we need to take. Here's where we need to watch. 
And after a little bit of time goes on, because you never forget, but mm-hmm. it, you do become more able to deal with it on a uh, more even keel as time passes. Sometimes that time frame may be more risky than right after the tragedy happens, because then you go into muscle memory of, okay, here's our processes, our battle drills, our procedures, that if this happens, we're going to do this. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, but what about later on when, hey, this this person who may have known this other person, whether it be directly, maybe they were friends with them, they were a respected member of the unit, particularly when a key member of the unit is lost. Hey, do I know enough about that person as a leader to understand, hey, they're they're not quite acting normal. Mm-hmm. Is there something else bothering them? And even when it's not something that's directly related to a military or work-related trauma, that will give a leader, particularly a first-line leader at the appropriate level, indicators if they know the man or the woman behind the uniform, hey, maybe I need to take them aside and talk to them. Hey, is there something going on outside the unit? Maybe they're having a struggle at work. Maybe they're, they need some, some help, but they're afraid to ask for it because of the perceptions of what it will do mm-hmm. to their career or what other people will think which, by the way, the military has made significant strides over the last number of years to, to mitigate that. And that's actually, that's, that's a very good point, because that's something I was wondering about, too, is the idea of you know, the, the Army has rules, uh, the Army has procedures, but the Army also has culture, which is felt rather than, rather than written down. And how do you feel that Army culture either uh, encourages or inhibits the development of empathy and emotional intelligence among leaders? As I mentioned earlier, when I first joined the military in the mid-90s, mm-hmm. there was that, hey, you know, strong soldiers don't cry. Strong soldiers don't ask for psychological help. It's a sign of weakness, even though the official line has always been, you know, ask for help. Right. But particularly after 9-11 and that impact to the nation's psyche, and then all the combat deployments, Iraq, Afghanistan, various other theaters that we've been engaged in, over those intervening couple of decades, there has been significant progress where it says, no, it really is okay to ask for help. Mm -hmm. It's not a sign of strength or sign of weakness, excuse me, to say, hey, I need help. I need to talk to somebody. That's actually a sign of strength because that's very, very difficult, particularly in our culture military culture that says hey i'm rock solid i'm hardcore i'm a war fighter which absolutely our you know our service members are sure but if we don't realize particularly as leaders and it becomes even more so in a leadership position hey i can't show weakness to my subordinates Mm -hmm. you don't have to be perfect nobody is you need to be an effective leader and part of that is acknowledging you're human too I guess you have to be strong enough not to be afraid of yourself, right? And, exactly. Uh, and and this is this, so. This is the kind of thing that a leader both uh, models in the leader's own conduct and in the way that the leader interacts with subordinates, because yes. that encourages then how subordinates will interact with each other. Yes. Uh, and uh, have you? Uh, I know the article just came out, but have you received any? Have you received any feedback yet from from any? Uh, from any readers yet about it. We're going to, by the way, to make sure to include the, a link to the article in the show notes for the podcast in case anybody wants to follow up. And I actually did, uh, one of my, uh, actually my former boss from my last duty station, mm-hmm. uh, who's currently at the Pentagon, reached out to me, said, hey, you know, I read the article. And one thing they absolutely agreed on was particularly with young military policemen and women and civilian law enforcement, particularly the young ones that, and young, not necessarily meaning in age, mm-hmm. which but for military police, they are quite young. Because mm-hmm. civilian police departments, you have to be 21 or older. Military police and the other service equivalents, you could have someone as young as 18. Right. With law enforcement authority and responsibilities, they could respond to a tragic accident with death involved. They could respond to suicides, barricaded subjects. And I have known some very young MPs who have done that. Uh, or losing somebody through accident. Mm-hmm. And they have not seen that before, just like the two medics uh, in the the uh, vignette with Staff Sergeant G. They were extremely young. They had been in the military less than a year. They had never deployed to combat at that point. 
and this was back in 2005, 2006 time frame, they had never seen death before. <laughs> and then it's like somebody that they knew and talked to on a regular basis, wham, it hits the unit like a ton of bricks. Right. And they thought they had let him die. Mm-hmm. That's where the, the leadership follow-up is critical as well. But you have to have that foundation of trust and relationships within a unit because that trust is what cements that unit together and lets it be resilient to come through, as we say, the valley of the shadow of death, whether it be accidental or combat related. Mm-hmm. Colonel Deaton, do you, ex- do you plan to stay in the uh, law enforcement uh, field as a, or, or what, 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 what is your sense of, of where you would like your leadership journey to take you? Well, as far as in the military, I um, love what I do. Mm-hmm. love being in the military police regiment. It was my first choice of branch when mm-hmm. uh, I was commissioning as a cadet. Uh, con- plan to continue uh, doing this as long as God willing and the Army will have me. Uh, <laughs> consider it an absolute honor to, to serve in the regiment and serve the nation. And I just appreciate the mentors and leaders who have shown me what leadership is. And as I've said repeatedly, I've had officer mentors that have absolutely critical effect, but the vast majority of credit I will give to the men and women who wear stripes, the sergeants, the NCOs who taught me as a young officer what leading really meant, what it meant to care about soldiers and other service members, and showed me what right looked like as a young officer and gave me that mentorship. And then that was furthered by those senior officers who also took the time to care. And I see it as my duty to give back to other younger leaders the benefits I received from mentors and others who were leaders beyond the ordinary, it's my turn to give back to them there you go. and so help it, them be the next generation. So a gift, a gift that's been given to you that you protect and then carry on for the future and give to someone else. Absolutely. Well, Colonel Deaton, that's a, that's a wonderful and hopeful uh, model for leadership for us to end this conversation on. I really want to thank you for joining us today. Thank you for your service. Thank you for your thoughtful ar- uh, article and for the arguments that you've made today. I hope that they'll help our listeners to think about the meaning of leadership and what that, uh, what that can actually, what leaders can actually accomplish in, uh, in helping their subordinates get through the traumas that life will bring. But thanks very much for joining us here on A Better Peace. Thank you to all of you for listening to this episode of A Better Peace. Please uh, send us your comments and suggestions for future programs. We're always open to listening to those. But uh, until next time, from the War Room, I'm Ron Granary. Thanks for joining us. If you've enjoyed this podcast and want to hear even more great content, subscribe to A Better Peace, the War Room podcast at iTunes, Google Play, or your favorite subscription service. And that concludes our program. Thank you for listening. The views expressed in this podcast reflect those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views, policies, or positions of the U.S. Army or the Department of Defense. Let us know what you think. Provide us your feedback, comments, or suggestions through our webpage at warroom.armywarcollege.edu. And have a great day.